All right, greetings, everybody. Welcome to the 2016 Black Sustainability Summit. This is session two of Incala Environmentals in Sucre, Design Considerations for Roof Water Harvesting in Africa. I am Yao Agade, and this is, again, session two. So let us get right into it. In session one, you gave a uh, brief biography of myself as well as Incala Environmental give some views on African sustainability as well as our approach to engineering development using indigenous knowledge, appropriate technology, and indigenous development. And session one was mainly an overview of rainwater harvesting. So now we're getting into the sprouts, session two, and we're going to look at some of the major design considerations, conceptual design considerations when designing your rainwater harvesting system. So last time we left off with the story of Kwabena, Besidaim, and Apotro. And a brief recap of that story is that Kwabena, Besidaim was in need of a rainwater harvesting system. And Apotro, the frog, volunteered to design such a system for him. But he had ulterior motives that he wanted to design a system that would increased the number of mosquitoes and algae available for him and his buddies to eat. And he did just that. And he left off last time. Pabinape Sidani was going to confront Apotro when he heard him bragging to all of his frog friends about how he had tricked Pabinape Sidani. And Pabinape Sidani is now going back to the village infuriated at what he has heard and discovered that Apotro the frog was not volunteering to help him at all. He was only volunteering to make a very, very bad situation for him. So, Kwabana Besidain is upset. So he toils about it. He goes back and forth in his mind what he should do. He finally gets an idea and he sets off for the Ahimfie, for the palace of his village. And he wants to speak to the Ohini the king of the village or the chief of the village. And so he goes in front of the king's elders and his entourage and he speaks to his achiamme spokesperson and explains how the Apotro did such a wonderful job on the design and the implementation of his rainwater harvesting system that he is so pleased with everything that Apotro was able to do with him. He just starts to go on and on about how great and how brilliant Apotro was. And he said he just had to share it with Ahimi because he had done such a great job. And not only did the frog's design help to solve his water supply issue, which of course we know it didn't, it also eliminated his mosquito problem. So all praises to brilliant Apotro. So after his long monologue of praise, false monologue of praise for Apotro, the Ahene, the king, is very, very impressed by what he hears. And so he sends his hunters to go and bring Apotro to come before him. And he wants to enlist Apotro in building a similar rainwater harvesting system for him. So the hunters go and they bring Apotro before the king. And Apotro greets the king as is appropriate. And the king offers him a drink of water and he offers him a seat. And the Apotro, of course, asks Manya, he says, what is, what is my mission for today? Why have you sent for me? And the Ochiame explains to him that the Ohene, the king, was very impressed by what he had heard uh, about Apotro's engineering design skills in building rainwater harvesting systems. And he would like for the Ohene, the king would like for the Apotro to build the exact same rainwater harvesting system for his palace. And of course, Apotro knows nothing about building rainwater harvesting systems that actually function the way that they should. And so uh, he's like, uh, no, I can't, I can't do that. Uh, that's, 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 yeah, it's a, it's a one of a kind system, and uh, that's, that's pretty much it. And that, that's a one shot. Deal, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And the, or king, the king's achiame, or the, the achiame, or the ahene, 
of course, understanding his role well, understood that no, he, of course he can't convey that message back to him. So he begs and pleads with the Apotro and starts to sing the Apotro's praises in the same way that Prabhupada Sidain did. He tells him about how he heard how the Apotro was such a brilliant designer and how he was so so innovative in his design. He was such a creative problem solver and how he's the best that our village has to offer. And he continues on and on and on, bigging up our patrol, singing his praises, bigging his head, making his head get big and big and swole to the point that Apotro cuts him off. And he gets so excited that he emphatically agrees that he will build the best rainwater harvesting system that the Ohene and the village have ever seen. And not only will he supply water for the entire palace, he's going to eliminate all the mosquitoes, and he's going to guarantee a steady supply of fresh, clean water all year round, no matter what's happening. No, it doesn't matter what drought or what kind of famine or anything like that. He's going to build the best system, and, 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 and it's going to be great. And the king, of course, hears this from the Ochiame and expresses doubt that mm, I'm not sure that the Apotro is able to do all of those things. I'm not, I don't even know that rainwater harvesting can do that, that you can guarantee a steady supply of water all year round. Mm, I'm not sure. So Apotro again jumps up when he hears the Ahene's doubt and he swears an oath to him, a solemn vow, that if he is not able to deliver on the promises that he has made, then the king, the Ahene, can cut his head off. And he makes that vow and then goes to work. And the king agrees and says, all right, fine, very good. So the Apotro goes about building the system. He works night and day in trying to actually build a rainwater harvesting system that works. But unfortunately, he knows nothing about building rainwater harvesting systems because he is a frog. And as a result, he fails miserably. The system that he builds doesn't work. The water that it catches or captures is not drinkable. The mosquito problem is worsened. Algae problem is worsened. And of course, Apotro is in trouble. So he is captured by the hunters and the taken before the executioner, who with a strong swipe of his machete chops off the head of Apotro, and he swings so hard, and he chops the head so hard that his head flies up in the air and spins around and lands right back on the Apotro's shoulders. And that is why, up to this very day, the Apotro, the frog, has no neck. So that is my Anansi story. If it is sweet, if it is not sweet, take some and let some go and let some come back to me. All right. So let us continue on with our analysis of the design considerations of rainwater harvesting again for session two, the sprouts. OK, so we're going to, again, talk about design considerations. And so the first consideration or the first question that we're looking at is how much water can we harvest? Of course, that's the, the first question. Before you invest into a rainwater harvesting system, you have to figure out how much water can you expect to get? And what are the factors that determine that answer to that question? Well, of course, the very first one, it depends on the size of your tank. The bigger a tank that you can afford, the more water that you can harvest. And of course, like we said in session one, it is the tank that is typically the limiting factor in the design of rainwater harvesting systems. This is the most expensive component. And as the tanks get larger, so does the budget. You know, so does the amount of money that's required to purchase the tank in the system. And so that's probably one of the first things you want to look at is, what's your budget? How much money do you have is going to determine largely how much water you can harvest because that's going to determine how large of a tank you can afford to buy or to build. Also depends on how much space you have. We're in the bush, so space is not an issue. 
Uh, but for other people, if you're in an urban area, if you're in a city, you may be space limited. And so the size of your tank may be limited by that, in which case you might have to consider an underground tank, which comes with its own set of challenges. But space is one factor in how much water you can harvest. It depends on where your system is located. So we're talking about rainfall. And of course, we know that rainfall varies with the different areas of the world. So if you live in an arid um, place versus a tropical place versus a temperate place and so forth, um, you get different amounts of water. So in some places where there's not a lot of rain at any point during the year, rainwater harvesting may not be worth the money at all because you wouldn't be able to harvest enough of it. It wouldn't be financial, it would make financial sense. So it depends on where your system is located that if you are designing a rainwater harvesting system, you're in the bush, if you're off the grid in that way, you will definitely want to talk to locals, talk to elders who've been there who can tell you about rainfall patterns and can give you estimates of rainfall. In session three, we're going to look at some other tools that we can use to estimate rainfall, but there's definitely nothing better than um, talking to people who live in the exact area where you plan to do rainwater harvesting to get that type of information. It also depends on the area of your roof. And we talked last time also about the area of your roof being the projected roof area. And so the larger your roof area, the more rainwater you can capture. Right? So if you have a large tank and you have a large roof area and you get a decent amount of rain every year, you can expect, expect to capture uh, a decent amount of rainwater. Now again, same question, how much water can we harvest? And here it ultimately depends on how much rain falls on our roof. So this is really the main determining factor. And this is one of the challenges of rainwater harvesting uh, as opposed to other forms. So with, with, for example, if you have a borehole, you know, depending on where you are, most boreholes you can get water all year round. If you have a, you get water from uh, surface runoff from a river and so forth. And you can pretty much depend on that all year round for most rivers, not all, but most. But with rainwater harvesting, you only get water if it rains. And so that is the ultimate determination of how much water you can harvest. And you could build a rainwater harvesting system tomorrow with a sufficiently large roof area, with a sufficiently expensive and sufficiently a large tank, but then if it decides that it's not going to rain this year in your location, then the, roof, the rainwater harvesting isn't going to do it good. So we're ultimately at the mercy of the weather in this particular case with, with rainwater harvesting. So let's put some numbers to it. If we are looking at liters of water versus we're looking at gallons of water, depending on who the reference are, we can use these two first equations here in green to estimate how much water we get. So first dealing with liters, we can say that V, the volume of rainwater captured in liters is equal to 0.85, which is our runoff coefficient, which we'll talk about in a second, times the total, times R, which is the total yearly rainfall in millimeters, times A, which is the projected roof area in square meters. So if you multiply 0.85 times the yearly rainfall in millimeters times the projected roof area in square meters, you'll get the total volume of rain water that you can expect to capture on an annual basis. Now this 0.85 runoff coefficient is, the state is basically saying that only 85% of the water that falls on our projected roof area is capturable, if that's a word, is able to be captured in that 15% of it will be lost due to evaporation. Again, we're assuming we're in Africa and you know where we are, the insulation of the sun is very high and evaporation as a result is very, very high. So you lose a lot of water through evaporation. You're also going to lose water from splashing. So some of the water is going to fall on the roof and it's going to splash off and you're not going to be able to capture it in your rainwater harvesting system. So a good value to estimate um, the, that loss is this runoff coefficient that we have here is 0.85. Again, saying that 
five, only 85% of the, the, the rainfall will actually be converted into runoff that we would capture. Okay, so that's if we're dealing in liters. If we're dealing in gallons, and a lot of people, I'm sure in the U.S. or uh, where they still use gallons, where they use gallons. In that case, the volume of rainwater in gallons is equal to 0.53, which is that same 85% uh, runoff co coefficient, as well as a conversion factor. So 0 0.53 times the total yearly runoff in inches times the projected roof area in square feet, all right? And that will give us an estimated amount of rainwater in gallons. So this is one of the first calculations. This is what we can use one of the back of the napkin calculations that you can do to determine whether or not rainwater harvesting is appropriate for your location, all right? Now, the next thing that we have to think about is that the amount of runoff that's actually delivered to the user, or you, or whoever is using the system, is going to be less than the amount of rainfall captured. And we're looking at inefficiencies in terms of, so you've captured the rainwater, it's in your cistern, and once the water, once the water is taken from that cistern, there are going to be some losses there, perhaps due to spillage, things like that. And so we have this actual storage value which is in, which is a storage efficiency times the volume of water captured. And here we see typical values of that efficiency are between uh, 0.4 and 0.8. So some of the things that affect that efficiency um, is the tank size. So bigger is better in this case. So the larger the tank, the more efficient it is at storing water meaning that some of the water will be lost due to overflow. So that if it rains a lot and the water overflows, there's uh, an efficiency loss there because that water is, is not being stored. That water is overflowing and it's going, it's going elsewhere. Uh, climate also has an effect on the storage efficiency. Equatorial climates are the best because they have long, um, um, in, in, uh, because they have a, a long wet season. And on the converse, if you are in a um, location where you have a long dry season, then of course that's worse for your, your storage. Because again, about evaporation. And then the, another thing to look at is the way that the water is drowned down. So this is the demand. So a higher rate of demand means there's going to be a higher storage efficiency. Um, so more volume in total, but lower reliability. So that's another factor that affects the storage efficiency. So this is an answer to the question. This is a more specific answer of how much water we can harvest. This is how we actually calculate it. So let us look now at an example calculation of doing just that. Okay. So let's say we have, and we're doing this in, uh, in uh, U.S. imperial units, and that's what a lot of people are familiar with. Um, you think that the metric units are easier because the you know, units work out a lot easier. You have the conversion factor. So in this example, we have an annual rainfall of 45.3 inches, and we calculated that our projected roof area, that this is the roof area where we are going to be capturing rainwater from, that projected roof area is 258 square feet. So to calculate the expected runoff, we're going to say that the V, D, the volume of runoff in gallons, equals to 0 0.53, our constant, times our rainfall in inches, which is 45.3, times our projected roof area, which is 258 square feet. So I multiply all that together, and I get about 6,194 gallons per year. All right. So let's see if we can put that in context in terms of various types of systems that we can do with that. So if we, let's say, assume a 70% storage efficiency, then that means we would multiply that number 6,194 by 70% or 0.7, and the actual, water, actual amount of water that we would expect to store would be 4,000 336 gallons per year. So this is the this is the water that we're actually expecting to be able to use. Okay? So let's see what we can do with that. 
If we have a small tank, say a system that is a wet season only uh, tank, a wet season here, a lot of places in Africa we have two seasons, we have wet season and dry season, and this, let's estimate that our wet season is 20 weeks per year. That's a pretty good wet season. That's, that's um, close to half of a year. And based on that, then we can calculate that we would expect uh, an availability of 31 gallons per day only during the wet season. Right? So this is a type of system where we use it during the wet season um, and so we have rainwater, it's a very small system, so that means it's inexpensive because it's a small tank. But, like I said, because it's inexpensive, it requires a large, because it's a small tank, it requires a large amount of rainfall. So that's only during the wet season, that's only 20 weeks out of the year. So you might ask the question, why would you want rainwater harvesting during the wet season when rainwater is plentiful? And that's a good question. And we'll get into that answer in a second, um, but it has a lot to do with convenience. Uh, which, you know, we can have a whole discussion on that, but we'll get to that in a second. So let's just remember that, and we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, so let's say we have a little bit more money, so we go for a bigger, a medium-sized tank, a little bit larger than a small tank. And let's say this medium tank is sized for 40 weeks out of the year. So a, week is 50, or a year is 52 weeks. So 40 weeks is most of the year, but um, some of the dry season, we're gonna be out of luck. So with this type of system, with a medium-sized tank, then we can expect 15 and a half gallons per day of water for most of the year, for 40 weeks out of the 50 weeks. So, so that's not too bad. That's a, that's a pretty good system all right, for a medium tank. But again, since going from a small tank to a medium tank means cost goes up, all right? Then next, we can have a large tank. A large tank is perhaps for a sole source system where we are designing a system such that rainwater is our sole source of water. We're not planning to get water from anywhere else. So what that means is we need a very large, very expensive tank such that during the rainy season, we can capture all the water that we need during those 20 weeks of the rainy season and use that for the entire rest of, this, rest of the cycle until the next rainy season. So using this design, then we can expect to get about 12 gallons per day and maybe more, okay? It, it depends because our efficiency actually goes up with a larger tank. So perhaps we can get even more than 12 gallons per day. So, so these are just rough estimates based on this example, 45.3 inches. That's, that's an average amount of rainfall that you might see in a country like Ghana. Um, or, or the roof area, 258 square feet. That's uh, maybe like a 10 by 16 or something like that. It's not a, it's not a large uh, roof area. Or, or let's say a, a 25.8 by 10. So you say you got 26 feet length by 10 feet wide shack or house or what have you. And that's about how much water you can expect. So depending on the type of system that you have, if you have a very, very large tank, then you can use that, you know, with, with, with an expected 4,336 gallons per year, you can stretch that out to 12 gallons per day. And depending on your demand, that may, that may work. Or you can, you know, go for a medium tank, get a little bit more, for most of the year, and for some of the year you don't won't have any, or a small tank just for the wet season. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about these different types of systems. So how can we use rainwater? Well, we can use it as an emergency water source. So let's say we have a homestead, or let's say we're in a village, and we can capture rainwater just for emergency. So let's say you know we, we have, it's, it's, for, it's for, for fires. So you know we have a rain tank, and we use it in the case of there's a fire. And so, you know, it's a, it's a source of water that's, that's available and you can get a large quantity of water quickly in an emergency. So it's an emergency source of water. Or let's say we have another source of water that we use and we just use rainwater harvesting if there's an issue with that particular source of water, right? So just an emergency source of water. So it's really just a backup. Um, 
potable water source. Potable water source is what that is. It basically means that we're using about four gallons per person per, per day. That's that's the an average requirement of potable water. Four gallons of water per person per day, or well, that's maybe, maybe six liters per person per day for cooking, cleaning, and hygiene. And so this is what you use your rainwater for. You use it for cooking, cleaning, and hygiene. You use about four gallons per person per day. And you use other water sources for everything else. So maybe you go to the river and you use river water for laundry. Maybe you have, uh, you know, another source that you use for your garden and your livestock. And maybe you use river water for bathing, and your house cleaning, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a type of system that's, that's very doable and it's very feasible and it's less expensive because it's a, it's, it's a smaller system because you're only dealing with four gallons per person per day. So let's say you had a, a four person household then that you're talking about 16 gallons per day. Uh, so that's a smaller system and so it's not as difficult to, to design that. And it doesn't have to last as long as a larger system. Next, we've already talked about the wet season water source. And I asked the question, why would you want a rainwater harvesting system during the wet season? And it's, it's really just about convenience. So the idea is that if prior to having your rainwater system, uh, your source of water is a river that you have to walk to, it becomes less fun to fetch water if it's wet and rainy. So it's, 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 you know, it's definitely a welcome addition that if it's in the rainy season, to not have to go and hike through the woods to get to the river to fetch water when it's pouring down rain and it's mud everywhere. Being able to just step outside, you know, and, and get the water is the idea there. So it's a wet, in a wet season water source, uh, just, you know, ballpark numbers, you can have maybe 100 gallons of storage and um, 100 gallons of storage and maybe that'll last you two to four days. Uh, for two to four days, depending on your demand, of course. But with that 100 gallons of storage, that can meet your household demand during the rainy season. And again, like I just said, that can reduce the need for you to travel in the wet, in the mud, to fetch water. All right, so a wet season water source is, is, a, is another option for your rainwater system. And then moving along, rainwater harvesting can be used as a primary water source. And when we say primary, we're talking about about 60% of the year where you have a generous availability of water. 30% of the year you have a reduced availability of water. We're talking about the dry season now. And then 10% of the year you have no availability is, is basically what we're talking about. And so this is a primary source. What that means is that it's providing at least 70% of your yearly water use in situations where perhaps the alternatives um, you can use other alternatives during the dry season to supplement. And the, the, but the thing about it is that typically those alternatives are going to be more expensive. So you know if you have to purchase water from say a water truck or something like that, you know that's more expensive of course than having a rainwater harvest system. Or if you have to, you know do other means to get your water, then, you know, that's more expensive. That's not ideal, but it's only for 30% of the year. The other 70% of the year, you have a water source from your rainwater system, all right? And the way that you deal with a primary, the a rainwater harvesting as a primary water source, and how I said that, for 60% of the year, you have generous availability in the wet part of the year. 30% of the year is not as wet, so you have reduced availability. 10% of the year, you have no availability at all of water. Then what you have to do is what, we, what they call an adaptive management strategy. You have to adopt an adaptive management strategy. And what that means is that you have to ration your use of water depending on the water level in your system, depending on the water level in your tank. So that 60% of the year, when there is a generous availability of water, you can generously use water because it's available. But then as water drops that 30% of the year and it drops below a certain threshold level, then maybe you use a little bit less water for all of your activities. Maybe you're a little more careful in how you use water. 
And then when there is no availability of water, meaning it hasn't been raining in some weeks, and your tank is getting low, then it means that you really, really, really have to cut back on your water use and supplement it with other sources of water that are often more expensive. So that's primary water source. And again, from potable water to wet season water source to primary water source, your system is going from very small and very inexpensive to larger systems, more expensive systems. So a primary water source system is going to be much more expensive than that wet season water source. And then even beyond that, the most expensive system you can have is the sole source system, sole water source system. And what that means is you're a that means that you're in some place where there is little seasonality and rainfall. So you're not you, you're not in a location where you have a rainy season and an extended dry season. It's going to be very difficult to make, to, to make a soil water source system work. It means that you're in a place where you get 80 inches per year or more. Right? That's really the only time when that is a feasible, a soil water source is feasible. I mean, you're getting a lot of rain, 79 inches per year or more. If, that's, if you live in that type of situation, then perhaps you can do soil water source. Okay? So you don't have a lot of seasonality. Or another place, another uh, criteria where sole water source is appropriate is if there are other alternatives for you to get water are unpractical or impractical, they are overly expensive, or there's some other socially unacceptable reason why you wouldn't do it. In that case, then you still have, you do have the option of uh, sole source rainwater harvesting. And again, this is the most expensive system. You're going to have the largest tank because you need to save a lot of water uh, in order to meet all of your meet all of your demands. There's no supplementation here, right? So no situations again. If other alternatives are impractical or too expensive. Then sole source water is in, is a is a viable solution. Most of what you'll see are potable water source in wet season water source and primary water source. You'll also see it used for other reasons like people will do rainwater harvesting. It's kind of recreationally. Maybe you'll have just one or two rainwater barrels and use it to water your garden or you use it uh, to feed, to water your, you know, give water to your livestock. So you'll also see that as well. Other, other good uses of rainwater harvesting. All right, so continuing on, we can talk briefly about some of the reliability of rainwater harvesting. Um, with rainwater harvesting, it becomes, um, there's always the possibility of failure. Okay, so it has a lot of good points, but it's not beyond that thing. And so an obvious failure is if there are long periods of drought meaning that there are long periods without rain. And in that situation, of course, the rainwater harvesting system uh, will fail uh, if, it will, if it runs, if the tank runs dry. And, you know, we expect that because we know that that's the nature of rain. Sometimes we have droughts and we can anticipate it. And, you know, in doing our design, we, we design based on averages and statistics. And, 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 and we try to, you know, incorporate certain safety factors into our design to account for that to the much to the extent that we can. Um, but of course, we can't. We have to be prepared to pay for that, right? So a, a safety factor in rainwater harvesting means a larger tank, typically, and that carries with it a larger cost. So you know, it's, it's a difficult kind of. Um, uh, the liability issue to, to work through. Um, weather forecasting, you know, can be available depending on where you are. If you're in remote areas, there's often not a lot of data. But again, like I said, you know, if you are in touch with elders in your community, if you live in a rural area, likely there are still elders there who are in touch with the traditions. And there are traditional technologies that we can use to help us to predict uh, the forecast, and so you know, if you're in that situation, I would definitely tap into those resources and use them. All right. Um, so.
So drought, of course, is probably the main thing that is, a, is, a, is an issue with the reliability of rainwater harvesting. We also have natural disasters, and those can be subtle, uh, uh, sudden or gradual failures. Sudden failures are hurricanes, or earthquakes, or uh, you know, people not taking care of the systems. And one of the good things, though, about rainwater harvesting is it tends to outperform other systems when it relates to natural disasters because it's not a lot of infrastructure required and infrastructure, you know, basically a big tank and, and, and some, you know, inexpensive gutters, it's not really that prone to failure due to, you know, big storms and, and things of that nature. So rainwater harvesting compared to other systems does pretty well as it relates to natural disaster. The thing that gets rainwater harvesting systems are the gradual changes. These are the bigger threats to having a reliable rainwater harvesting system. And so this relates to the collapse of the infrastructure. So this is particularly talking about uh, you have a shared system that shares perhaps among a municipality. There's always maintenance that's required. If funding issues come up, then maintenance issues, then maintenance usually ends, maintenance stops. And that's when you can have challenges associated with the rainwater harvesting, uh, mechanical breakdown. In this picture here, you see a picture of a rainwater tank, and there's a big hole in it. And obviously, that's not good. They actually believe that a rat or something dug its way in there, or, or what, or something. But, um, but yeah, so you, you see that infrastructure decay is always a possibility when when you're when you're building these things. So um, Again, this is another place where rainwater harvesting excels over other systems that, you know, for example, boreholes. Boreholes, you have a lot more gradual threats to look at, such as, you know, depletion of aquifers. So, you know, we have a borehole, we're getting groundwater. But what happens when everyone has a borehole and everybody's using water for irrigation and for everything else? Groundwater aquifers can be easily depleted. And groundwater takes you know hundreds or thousands of years or more to recharge and so that can mean you are exhausting the, the resource. You can have poisoning of aquifers or even rivers by natural processes or by you know human activity. So you have uh, fluorides and arsenic and nitrates and sewage caused by human activities often can get in the rainwater, can get in the rivers and cause failure. So if you have a borehole, or if you're fetching water from the river and, and the groundwater or the river water is polluted, that becomes a failure of that system. Okay, and then of course, the, the issue of population that is, is population numbers increase. Again, particularly we're talking about boreholes, more people start taking water out of the ground, then that becomes an issue for sustainability. So rainwater harvesting is a good solution for, for all those things. Um, but you still do have to look at infrastructure decay. Reliability. So now, let's talk about when not to use rainwater harvesting. There are certain situations where rainwater harvesting does not work. One of the reasons that we did talk about a little bit in, in session one is when Apotro was suggesting to build a thatched roof, saying that, no, you shouldn't build a hard roof, you should build a thatched roof. Well, that's actually very wrong. That, that's one of the criteria when you don't want to use rainwater harvesting. You don't want to use when you have vegetative roofs, green roofs, thatch roofs, roofs that are made of organic type of materials. Um, that's typically not the best type of material to do rainwater harvesting for two reasons. One, because you're going to have a very low runoff coefficient, meaning that your organic roof is going to absorb a lot of the rainwater, so you're not going to be able to capture a lot of it, and two, because organic matter carries nutrients that are good for plants and, you know, and, and small animals and microorganisms, but they're bad for drinking water or water for any other use. And so when you have organic type materials, they introduce a lot of nutrients into the water and those nutrients attract microorganisms which make the water uh, difficult or impossible to drink. So that's when you don't want to use rainwater harvesting. 
don't want to use rainwater harvesting if there's not enough annual rainfall. So the system, you know, it doesn't make sense to build the system if rainfall is not um, in your area. So that's probably the first thing you want to check is do you have enough um, rainfall in your area? Okay. Um, next, no space or no permission for a rainwater harvesting tank. So, you know, no space, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. You have to have space to put your harvesting tank, um, you know, under, we talked about underground tanks briefly as well. We have to have permission. So if you're renting an apartment and you're renting a house, the person you're renting from may not allow you to build a rainwater harvesting system on your property. So that's the case when you would not want to build rainwater harvesting. Extreme air pollution. So in general, rainwater is very clean. Um, it's, it's, it's the most clean at the source. I mean, once it falls onto the roof, that's another story. But, you know, as it's falling, it's typically very clean, except in areas where you have extreme air pollution, where you have factories and smokestacks and all these things, particulate matter that when it rains, the rain removes that particulate matter from the atmosphere and transports it into your rainwater harvesting tank. So you have a lot of particulate matter in the air and it's raining, then your rainwater can become contaminated and it can be something that you uh, would be less desirable to drink. So um, areas of extreme air pollution is not a good idea to use rainwater harvesting. And finally, if you have a very high demand um, of rainwater harvesting, so let's say that your demand is greater than 10 gallons per person per day, that's 40 liters per person per day, then that is a, is a very high demand of water. And the first thing that you need to do is to reduce your water consumption um, before you get into rainwater harvesting. All right, so those are the areas where you do not go to use rainwater harvesting. All right, and this chart here is a chart that is showing required roof area for different types of rainwater harvesting systems and for different amounts of rain annual rainfall all right so here if we start at the top with sole source system where greater than 95 percent of the annual demand of five gallons per capita per day that's five gallons per person per day is met and we have two columns here so we have a large rainwater tank and we can see that with any given amount of annual rainfall um, so if we have you know, 30 inches of rainfall, then we need this many square feet of a roof per person to meet that demand. And as the rainfall amount of rainfall increases, we need less roof area, right? And that should make sense. The more rain, the less area that we need in order to capture that. The second row, where it has a tank size of extra large, is basically saying that if we have a larger tank, then we don't need as large of a roof area because we have more capacity for storage. So again, that's always the case if you can increase the roof area, or if you can increase the roof area, or if you can increase the storage, then you can increase your capacity. Of course, the one thing that we can't control is the rainfall intensity. So we can't just say, well, I'm just going to increase, I'm going to go to 80 inches per year. Well, no, you, you have that kind of power. And if you do, then holler at me and, and you need to talk. So you can increase your roof area, which typically, you know, your, your house is, is already built. The buildings are already there. It's, it's a little, maybe a little bit difficult, difficult to extend your roof area. Um, so typically what most people look at is increasing the tank size, which we've talked about, is expensive. So but that's sole source, right? Um, for the same amount of rainfall, if we use it as a primary source or a main source, we're fulfilling 70% of our annual need, which is, let's say, five gallons per person per day in the wet season, and three and a half gallons per person per day in the dry season. So we, we have an adaptive management strategy. We use, we use less water in the dry season. If we have a medium-sized tank, you see the roof areas that are required, and then again, if we have a large-sized tank, then the roof areas that are required, again, are less. And generally speaking, when we look at this table, you can see a trend going from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. That as the rainfall increases, the roof area needed uh, decreases. And as the 
the type of rainwater harvesting system as we go from the larger, more expensive system, the sole source system, to the smaller system, the portable water only system, that the required root area also reduces. So if we go back to session one, where we had the figure where we're dealing with the different configurations of uh, uh, the guttering of the conveyance system, you see that now, if you have a system that perhaps doesn't cover the entire guttered area, that's okay. Because if you're dealing with a small portable water system or a wet water only system, you don't necessarily need the largest roof area. So that's another consideration as well. Particularly if you don't think that gutters are the most attractive feature of your house. Let's talk a little bit about health and then we'll wrap it up for today. Uh, water quality. So we talked that earlier that rainwater harvesting in terms of watershed management is mainly in the realm of water quantity. That we're, we're mainly talking about controlling uh, the amount of runoff from impervious surfaces like your roof and helping in, in doing that helps to prevent erosion and sedimentation in our watershed, particularly in, in our streams and things of that nature. But there is also a water quality aspect of rainwater harvesting that we can speak of. So looking at this chart here, we see the path of contamination that we have in a rainwater harvesting system. That starting from uh, dust blown on our roof, that we have dust that has other uh, pathogens and microbial organisms on it, it lands on our roof from dust being blown, okay, or it's washed out of the air. If it's a chemical contamination, maybe again, if we're in a polluted chemical area, that pollution is washed onto our roof. And that roof can either direct, uh, that, that those contaminants, those chemical or those microbiological contaminants can either uh, directly enter into our tanks or they can be carried by water entering the tank. So the water, when it rains, can enter the tank uh, with those pollutants carrying it. Then they'll have a certain residence time, residence time in the tank, where they'll sit in the tank, and they will eventually end up at the tank outlet, which is the spigot, and ingested, ingestion. This is if we're drinking the water. That's what water quality is going to So we see the path of contamination and, and how it works. And it mostly has to do with um, how those contaminants get in the tank in the first place. So our tanks should be sealed, so they shouldn't, so, so vectors, insects, or animals shouldn't be able just to get in our tank and, you know, do things, defecate or die, things like that. That's a big issue, so our tanks should definitely be sealed for that reason. But even if they are sealed, we still see that there are real roots that contaminants can get into our tank. So the things that we're looking at, we're talking about uh, when we're talking about water quality, we're looking at pathogens. And most of the studies show that um, there's not a large amount of pathogens that you have to worry about with, with rainwater harvesting systems. Um, you know, done a lot of studies. And it's, it's, it's not that big of a, of, of a concern because, again, the rainwater itself is largely void of any type of pathogens. It's only on um, the rooftops that these type of things get introduced. Okay, and roofs themselves are hostile environments for pathogens. Um, and so, you know, a, a roof especially if one made out of steel, for example, gets very hot under the sunlight. It kills a lot of pathogens. And so, you know, having that type of system set up will help to protect your, your, your water quality. You know, same deal. This is another reason why we don't want to have organic matter roofs, thatch roofs, because they don't kill pathogens. They encourage pathogen growth. So that's another, um, another consideration. Another thing about pathogens, we could talk about gutter. In our in our story, we had the Apotro who said that the Kwabanak is dying, that his gutters needed to be flat, which of course is the exact wrong answer. Gutters need to be appropriately sloped because if they 
are flat, then you know that makes it easier for pathogens to grow. And because gutters are out of sight, out of mind, they often don't get clean in a very long time. They can accrue large amounts of organic material, and if that organic material enters the tank, that is yummy, yummy food for pathogens and bacteria and insects. And, and the, the, the process of die-off that happens on the roof is not as effective inside of the tank, especially when it's full of those nutrients. So those are some of the ways that pathogens are um, entering and in, in are a part of the tank. So you know, with any type of water system that you use, it's important to have periodic checks, water quality testing to see the quality of the water in your system. That's really the only way that you can know uh, what you're getting. And, you know, of course, if you're using it as a portable water source, it's important to make sure you have some type of treatment, sand filtration, or you can do uh, SOTUS, solar disinfection, and uh, other types of treatment options, various options that you have. Acidity. So let's talk briefly about acidity. Um, most of us are taught that water is pH 7 and is not easy to find water that's pH 7 in the real world. Water is only pH 7 in science textbooks. Most of the real world, water is not pH 7. So first of all, let's get that out of your mind. So somebody who, people who talk a lot about pH and your water should be pH 7, it will be very, very hard for you to find some pH 7 naturally in water. All right? So if you want pH 7 water, you have to have a special science-y, technological filter that is making your pH 7 water. Particularly when we talk about rainwater, because it's falling in the atmosphere, it's mixing with carbon dioxide, which has an acidifying effect on it. It lowers the pH, and so the pH of rainwater is slightly acidic. It's between 4 and 5.6, which you'll, which you'll find the, the pH of, um, of rainwater. Of course, depending on the amount of pollution in the area. The more air pollution you have, then the more, quote unquote, acid rain you get to the more acidic you your rainwater becomes. But typically your rainwater is about 5.6 pH. And that's okay. All right, that's 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 not too bad. For those of us who you know desire more alkaline tasting water, you may want to opt for a concrete storage tank. The concrete, the materials in the concrete uh, storage tank are um, uh, increased alkalinity and so they can increase the pH and make it less acidic and more alkaline. And so the, that's something that people who have those concrete tanks um, do. So if you are a pH nut, and you're always worried about the pH of your everything, then you might want to opt for a concrete tank. Maybe more expensive, but uh, it's an option. Heavy metals. So urban pollutants. So if you have a metal roof, if your roof is decaying, if it's rusting, then uh, those heavy metals can get into, and will get into your rainwater harvesting system. The good thing about it is that um, the, um, oh, and let me say that, let me back up for one second. For, for the concrete tanks, uh, having the, the calcium in the cement It'll increase your, if you want some numbers, it'll, it can increase your alkalinity to about 8 or 9. So, you're, you know, like I said, if you're really focused on pH, then that's what you'll get with rainwater harvesting in a concrete tank. Otherwise, you can expect a pH of about 5.6 to 6, unless you have more acidic, unless you have acid rain, which you might have a pH around 4. All right, so with heavy metals, um, you typically see that in urban areas. Heavy metals, sulfates get into the water, and they have been found in, in various studies to be present. They're not found in the rainwater itself, but like I said, it is largely comes from the roof, uh, which if you have a, um, let's say, a, a, a roof that's lead or zinc, um, those type of metals can leach out of the roof into itself. It's not very practical to really filter heavy metals like that, but there have been studies that have found that, well, well let me back first off, that's kind of one of the reasons for, again, another reason for a first flush system that we talked about in session one, 
because um, usually it's not a continuous stream, it's really just a first flush kind of thing, and having that first flush greatly reduces the amount of heavy metals in your system. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that the metals are usually very dense. The suspended metals are very dense. And so when they enter your tank, they usually get to the very bottom of your tank. And most of the time, they're not going to be resuspended. And so even if you have heavy metals that are getting into your tank, it, there are, there's a decreased risk that you'll actually be able to get them, you know, extract them out of the water. And there are systems, uh, there are uh, systems that you can put in place inside of your rainwater harvesting tank to uh, basically disrupt the, to, to make it such that when the water comes in, it doesn't mix everything up, right? And so there, there are things you can put in place to, to do that, and that's one of the reasons why. Um, suspended sediment, so this is just, this is um, turbidity, this is murky water, so things like dust and sand that can cause your water to be turbid. Um, it's probably the largest component of pollution that you'll see in rainwater harvesting system. These are basically particles on the roof that get washed into the system. Again, first flush system does well to deal, to, to curb those things. and. If you're doing your water quality test, you want to test for turbidity. And the turbidity gives you a measure of the cloudiness of the material. And the good news is that suspended sediment is usually non-toxic unless, of course, you have previous issues with heavy metals and urban pollutants. But the suspended sediments can carry organic materials, which are food for microorganisms. And, you know, it's an aesthetic thing. It just doesn't look good. You don't want to, you know, open your tap of your rainwater harvest system and a bunch of muddy looking water comes out. It, just, it, it might not make you feel as confident in drinking that water. Um, so there are definitely ways that you can filter the water and we've already talked about treatment that you can do. Um, one of my favorite types of treatment is what they call SOTUS, solar disinfection. Um, or you can use UV lamps. I would not use chlorine because the issue with chlorine is that you use chlorine. Chlorine reacts with any organic matter and it forms what they call disinfection byproducts. Uh, uh, THBs and halomethagenes and all these kind of cancer causing things that you don't want to deal with. So stay away from chlorine type of products if you can. Um, that would be good. But just like with pathogens, rainwater in itself tends to be, tends to not produce a lot of turbidity. So, you know, again, you, you, you're not getting a lot of uh, nastiness from rainwater. It's only from your roof that, that you're dealing with. So filtration is the way to go. Asbestos. A lot of people have the asbestos roofing tiles and they wonder about, you know, drinking the water from that. There have been studies done, a number of studies, that have not shown there to be a negative impact of drinking water from asbestos towels. It's definitely, you know, you cannot breathe in asbestos dust, and that can be harmful to your lungs and cancer causing to your lungs, but so far there has not been any uh, conclusive research that says that you know there are issues with asbestos and drinking water from an asbestos sink. Um, good practice that if you are designing a house, if you're building a house, just try to use a, a roof material that's a little more front. Personally I like the clay tiles, the hard clay glazed tiles. So they just look better to me anyway. So but like I said according to the research out there the asbestos should not give you a problem. Mosquitoes! Alright, most people, when you talk about rainwater harvesting, the first thing they jump up and say, oh no, it'll make mosquitoes. Well, it depends on the type of rainwater harvesting system that you develop. If you develop the Apotro brand rainwater harvesting system that was designed to breed mosquitoes, then yes, you will breed mosquitoes. And the rain barrel that you see here will breed mosquitoes. And then if you look at the picture, you can kind of see little particles of uh, mosquito larvae swimming around in that water. And the reason for that is because all of the elements for mosquito breeding are there. 
So you have the open top so they have access to come in and lay their eggs. So that's the first thing. You don't want mosquitoes, you seal off your cistern, you seal off your rain tank so that they cannot just come in and lay their eggs. The second element that mosquitoes need is they need light. Well, they don't need light, they themselves, but the food that they eat requires light it, because the food they eat has to do photosynthesis. So by having light, you are allowing the food of the mosquito larvae to grow. So if you don't want them to have food, then you don't have light. So not having light will cause, they may even, even if they get in by some miraculous uh, uh, circumstance and lay their eggs, the eggs will not, the eggs will not survive if there's no food. And if there's no light, then they can have no food. So light becomes a big way to, and the control of light becomes a big way to prevent mosquitoes from breeding in your rainwater tank. And also, and, and I can add to that, closing off your tank as well. So not having an open tank such as this. Screens are another good option. I mean, you could have, you can, there are mosquito screens that you can get for the various openings in your tank. And then we've already talked about the first flush system to prevent any type of nutrients from being washed into the rainwater harvesting system to feed those mosquito larvae. Uh, I've also heard of uh, using oil, like vegetable oils. Put a small layer of vegetable oil on the top of the, on, on the water, and it'll, it'll float to the top, and basically it suffocates the mosquitoes that, that may get in there. The only issue is that is that only issue with that is that um, vegetable oil, if left to sit for too long, becomes rancid. And so, if, if you're going to do that, then it's, it has to be something that you know you leave it there for a period of time. And you have to come and you know, clean it off, scrape, you know, filter it off, and then put in a new, um, a new uh, layer of, of vegetable oil on there. So you have to be careful with that. But really, if you control the light and you have a good first flush system, you should not have problems with mosquitoes at all. Underground tanks, we've uh, talked about that before. There are, they can be good if, there are, if you have space limitations, but uh, there are a lot of challenges that for us in our context make them not a good option. Because again, we're in a rural area, space is not an option. When you have an underground tank, now you have to have a pump. None of the systems that we've talked about so far require any type of electricity. That, was, that makes them good for our circumstance because we're off grid, so we are rationing whatever electricity we do produce very heavily. So we don't want to just use electricity. If you have an underground pump, then you need, or if you have an underground tank, you need a pump. Now your pump doesn't have to be electrical. It can be a hand pump. You can have a windmill. Um, so those are options for you as well. But most people, you know, prefer those the electric pump. Even if you get like a solar power panel, a solar power pump, solar panel power pump, then you can use that as well. But uh, you, you'll need some type of pump, whether it's a mechanically powered pump or an electrically powered pump, in order to get the water out of your underground tank. The underground tanks, of course, can be hazards. Uh, if there's a, the, so you see the cover for this tank is here in this animation and this graphic. If those covers go missing, and of course, that's a very big hazard for children or. Um, People who are walking around at night, if that cover is off, then you know people can fall into that tank, and, and that's that's definitely a big issue. Uh, another thought about the tanks is that um, makes them a little bit more difficult to maintain um, because they're underground. Maintenance is not as easy to to access to get in them. Uh, another issue is it requires a large amount of excavation to get your tank underground. Excavation can be dangerous in certain soils, but in all cases it can be expensive depending on the means that you're using to excavate, whether it's human labor or whether you're renting uh, machinery. So uh, this is a couple of extra words on underground tanks. But you know, if you are in a situation where you need that footprint to to, to, to remain clear, 
and you don't want to see that rainwater harvesting tank, then you definitely can have an underground system. Okay, so that concludes session number two. And what we've talked about today are some of the design considerations for uh, designing rainwater harvesting system. If you have any questions, I hope to hear from you at the question and answer session.